You can hear me okay, Michelle? Yes. You're All good. Right. Thank you everyone for joining and uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce um, Ed who is um, you know, going to talk to us about his own journey as uh, uh, diagnosis of ALS and also you know, what he's done and he's the chair of uh, Answer ALS and he's also you know, working on many other initiatives and uh, like I mentioned, you know, I consider him a friend and I feel like I'm fortunate to have that friendship. And those of you who haven't met him, I'm glad you're here and you get to know him personally. And also uh, today attending is um, Jeff Rothstein, who is uh, um, a you know, neurologist at Johns Hopkins. And thank you, Jeff, for joining us as well. And uh, we will make this a very interactive um, um, meeting and we will have, first Ed will go through the presentation and after that, please, send all of your chats on the chat box, like McFinn said earlier. And we have um, you know, a couple of the people whom we'll introduce a little later, um, uh, Tara and Zoe, who will actually be looking at the chat and will be asking questions to Ed after the presentation. So um, with that, uh, thank you, Ed, and I will uh, have um, Ed take over. Uh, Indu, thank you. Uh, first of all, I'm glad to hear we got Jeff on the line. We get a deep technical questions we will have him to turn to. The other one is one, one of the things that I've done since being diagnosed with ALS is I keep a list of the gifts of, of ALS. And one of them is the people that I've come across and tonight's a great example of it and probably no better example than Indu. Um, she's a great partner, a great friend. And while we got to this point through a difficult journey, it, it gives me strength in every day, you know, each and every day. And that's why I was glad to participate in this evening session. Uh, she wanted me to start a little bit with my background. Um, you know, I mean, if you go back, I, I hail from Pilot Grove, Missouri, population 700. I'm one of seven kids, the middle child of seven. As I used to tell my mom, I'm the neglected middle child. And her response was always the same. With seven kids, you're all neglected. Get over it. Uh, but the reality is there was no neglect, and I had a great upbringing, a very strong family, very strong faith. Uh, went to the University of Missouri, uh, graduated, and then went to Caterpillar. And, and, I, and I lived and worked around the world with Caterpillar for 37 years. I did stints in the U.S., uh, Africa, Europe, Asia. Um, and, and over that 37 year career, I absolutely loved what I did and kept myself in, in good shape and in good health. And I got 12 months away from potentially becoming the CEO of the company uh, when I started having trouble with my left foot dragging when I was jogging. And it led me down the journey that most ALS patients go through of going to multiple doctors before finally getting to the Mayo Clinic in November of 2015 and hearing the words that many of you have heard uttered, you know, you have ALS. Um, I remember it like yesterday, and I remember the discussion with a neurologist, and my wife, out of frustration, just said to him, you know, what do you recommend we do? And his response was, I think you should make a list of every place in the world you've ever wanted to go, and you should go now. Uh, to which I responded, I've already been there. Uh, you know, I, we'd lived and worked around the world. I traveled to more than 100 countries, and I figured my time was better off spent with a lot of quality time with my family and in trying to make a difference in what is a tough disease. As, as I started to try to figure out how to make a difference, as many of you know, it's a very fragmented world of ALS. And... I, I really had two parameters I was looking for on where I was going to engage. Number one, I was looking for a highly collaborative effort. You know, years in industry taught me the great innovation comes from great collaboration. And, and collaboration really wasn't a hallmark of the ALS research you know, world. And I was just looking for places or pockets where collaboration was really valued. The second is I was looking for innovative approaches. Um, you know, a lot has changed over the last 10 to 20 years in terms of technology. So who was innovating to take a new approach? Both of those led me um, to the Packard Center, uh, to Jeff Rothstein, and, and then to a project called Answer ALS. 
And, and so that's the journey that kind of led me to being, you know, here with you tonight. If you, at a high level, what we're trying to prove out is a basic hypothesis that there is not one form of the disease. That, you know, ALS is unlikely, unlikely to be that one disease. It's more likely to be a collection of subtypes. Um, think about cancer. Um, in the early days, there was one treatment for cancer and it wasn't very successful. It wasn't until they understood the subtypes of cancer that they really started to make breakthroughs. And, and our basic belief is the same applies to ALS. I mean, if you look over the last 20 years, there's been 200 drug trials and two that have been approved by the FDA. And both of them have limited efficacy. And so to continue to do the same things in the same way and expect breakthroughs, you know, I just, I just never thought that it was logical and, and, and I wanted to be engaged, you know, with a new approach. And so at a high level, our mission is to build the most comprehensive clinical and biological assessment of ALS in history. And, and then we want to turn researchers, researchers, scientists, uh, analytics, machine learning, other capability loose to, to understand and ultimately end ALS with the discovery of subgroups. You know, research and medicine and pharma is proven. You give them the pathways, they can bring solutions. And, and our objective is to create the database that they need to, uh, to discover those pathways. So l let me walk through the process. And this is going to be the, probably the most challenging of the, uh, the walkthroughs, but it really outlines the, the total answer ALS process. If you start on the left-hand side, you see the anonymized volunteer participants. You know, just over a thousand have been, you know, bought into the program through eight different clinics. Uh, I'm one of the patients. Uh, as you can see from the clinics that we selected, we went with those that had a high volume of patients. If you think about what it takes to, to you know, get a thousand patients into a trial like this, you had to go to the high volume places. And you can see the list there in terms of Hopkins and Mass General and Cedar sinai and Ohio University and Emory and the rest of them. Um, but it was a, it was a key challenge to get that done. I think we did two things right in that area. One went with the high volume clinics. And the second thing we did is we provided funding for each of those clinics uh, so they could have dedicated staff to handle the enrollment. Uh, because the whole thing to get this thing started was to get the thousand patients enrolled in the program, which we've now done. Once we did that, then you start to break out into a, a number of different areas. Uh, first thing, you know, the clinical data was now captured from the clinical observations, and that would be fed to the portal, which I'll talk about later, where we store the data. You send the samples off to the New York Genome Center. And one of the things that the project decided up front was to focus on those institutions that were world-class good in what we needed to get done. And so for all the genetic sequencing, we're using the New York Genome Center. And, and we've done over 900 the genome sequences in terms of the thousand participants in the program. And that work is well underway. Another leader in the world of ALS is Cedar sinai And that's where we sent the original, the, the what I call the PBMCs, the peripheral blood mononuclear cells. And, and that's basically where from, you know, my blood, they can then from that PBMC create an induced pluripotent stem cell or an IPSC. And then from that, they can create my motor neuron. I mean, Unfortunately, it's not like other things where you can do replacements. You can't take the creation of my motor neuron here in an embryonic state and put it back in the human because you can't infiltrate the brain or the spinal cord. But in many ways, what that motor neuron gives researchers is something they've always longed for. 
And that's, a, in essence, a biopsy of the brain. And then with the motor neurons, we, we get into the omics. Uh, you know, most people, when they think about omics, think about genomics, the, the sequence that we talked about above. But there's other areas that with the motor neuron, we can start to inspect. Uh, transcriptomics, which gets into RNA, uh, metabolic omics, which is kind of the cellular breakout of, of, of the products in the cell. If you think about a person, if you, if you analyze their garbage at the end of the week, you probably get a good sense of what's going on inside the house. Uh, the same applies here, where if you analyze the byproducts of the cell, you get a really good feel for what's going on inside the cell. Uh, proteomics, which is the review of the proteins, and then epigenomics looks at the modification of DNA as a result of environmental factors. And all of that review can happen once you create those motor neurons. And once again, all of that data gets fed forward into the portal, which I'll talk about a little later. Uh, on the top of the chart, you see clinical data collection 24-7. In addition to the clinical sites, we have an app uh, which patients can use, which monitors everything from speech to agility. Uh, I, I think this is an area of research that, that we've initiated but has tremendous opportunities to grow in the future. And then down on the bottom of the side, you see Mass General, where we're doing the blood biobanking. And, and, and we will have the lot, largest repository of biofluid samples related to ALS in the world. And all of that data, in essence, will flow and be put into a portal and then made available to anybody in the world on an open format, uh, anybody in the world doing ALS research. Um, you know, just to scope it for each individual we, we are going to capture somewhere in the neighborhood of 5 billion data points. Um, so that gives you a high level view in terms of the process that, that we're using. And, and the thing to think about is no individual company, uh, no individual research firm could afford to do this on their own. And it really, it had to come about due to a collaboration amongst many. And this has been the ultimate team sport. I mean, if you look at the people who played a role in making this happen, you know, you've got the eight institutions that I talked about. You've got 24 research centers. You got, you know, corporations like American Airlines and Caterpillar and Microsoft and IBM and the Travelers. You've got sports, NFL, you know, the PGA, you've got you know, consulting companies, you got other nonprofits. And we've also been able to secure good support from within the ALS world, like MDA and also ALS Finding a Cure. I, I think with any initiative though, you know, that there's, there's been a lot of partnership that's occurred as we've executed the program, but but I think the ones that really stick out to me that we really need to acknowledge are the likes of Jay Fishman um, and, and Lee Rizzuto, who were two of the major funders in the early days. Uh, you got to think about a guy like Steve Gleason, who, who really brought together the group that originally concepted it. You, you know, Jeff Rothstein's on the, on the line, and, and he just is, has been an arch, the architect behind this. And then that small group grew into the people and the companies that you've seen here on this list. And it's got patients and it's got clinical, you know, support. It's got caregivers who are in many cases, the control. It is, it, you know, the ultimate team sport. And, um, you know, the people I've met on this journey that are represented on this page, um, as I said earlier, it's, it's one of the gifts of what is, uh, ALS. Now, it's not like we're just starting to talk about this. Um, you know, we've made good progress to date. So if you look at where we're at and how the enrollment and the follow-up on the original clinical visits is 100% done. We've got 1,046 participants already enrolled. 
Um, the whole genome sequencing is 93% uh, completed on those 1,046. On stem cell lines, the iPSCs, 62% complete. On motor neurons, we're at about 28%. And that's really, if you think about it from a factory perspective, that's the bottleneck because it takes about six months to go from that blood sample to the motor neuron. And then once the motor neuron is done, then you can start doing the multi-omics. And we're at about a 20% rate there. It varies a little bit from omic to omic, but somewhere in the neighborhood of 20%. We've got a Gen 1 portal where, which stores and shares the data up and running. And then we're in the middle of the development of Gen 2. And that's in partnership with Microsoft, who's just not only helping us out on the portal, but providing the storage requirements for Antry LS uh, for free. I, I just I couldn't say enough about Microsoft as a partner. Uh, we've raised. 40 of the required 42 and a half million. And this gets back to the point I made earlier about how an individual research, you know, firm or uh, individual pharma would be, you know, limited in their ability to do this. You know, it's just hard to imagine anybody building a data source like this and, and then making it available to everybody in the world doing research for free. And to, and, and trust me, you know, the, Acknowledgements on the previous page are the people that have stepped up and provided funding uh, that allowed us to, to get where we're at. And, and we'll, we'll close the balance of that gap. The project completion in terms of the, all the data stored is really targeted toward the end of 2023. But, you know, the data analysis is already underway. There's 50 new research projects based on the data released to date. And in fact, we don't know if you need a thousand patients to start to unravel the mystery in the subgroups. And that's why we've already started data releases today. So far, we've released about 2.6 trillion data points. At the REN goal, will be about 20 trillion data points on an open platform. But as, as I said, there's a lot of research, you know, already underway uh, analyzing the data. And then the other thing we've already started to, to think about is the alignment with the Packard Center on what I would consider phase two. Phase one of Answer ALS, uh, there's an inventor named Dean Kamen, and he talked about innovation has to come about in the form of dominoes. You gotta knock the first domino down before the second. I think the first domino that got knocked down here was when you know, computing power, exponential data, you know, that kind of capability, you know, came about. I mean, if you go back and look at history, the, the first human genome project took 13 years and cost $3 billion. Uh, we've just sequenced over 900 at an average cost of less than 1,000. And you take that combined with computing power, ability to store, those things were the first domino. The next domino to fall is to unravel the mystery behind the subgroups. And once we do that, then the next domino to fall is therapeutics based on research that start to bring us to a cure. And, and that phase is what we're thinking about. That domino is what we're thinking about as we align with Packard on the possibility of a phase two answer ALS that starts to direct research toward the findings that come out of the data. And so, you know, we, we have a, a long way to go, uh, but we've got a disciplined governance structure. Uh, we've got a bunch of committed people. Um, you know, we were together right before the pandemic broke out. And you know, the thing that I'm always amazed by is even though you've got eight clinical institutes and, and 24 research centers, if you don't read their name badge, you can't tell who works for who. It's just a bunch of passionate people who really do think this is a way to make a difference you know, in this you know, disease. Now, oftentimes, you know, in a discussion, discussion like this, a question that comes up is, okay, what, what can I do to help? Um, you know, I firmly believe that a 
1,000 ALS patients do have the answer. That, that in this database, in this portal, is going to be the, you know, the secret that starts to unravel the mystery. I describe it as building the haystack and then turning the world and analytics and machine learning and artificial intelligence loose to, to unravel the mystery. And if, but if I think about the audience tonight, I think there's, there's two things. One is, is be an ambassador for the approach. The fact that, that data you know, could be a big part of the answer. It's, a, it's an innovative approach. It hadn't been tried in the past. But, but as I said earlier, 200 drug trials, two drugs on the market with a limited efficacy, let's be honest with ourselves. The past approach hasn't worked. And, and I'm absolutely convinced by embracing technology that's developed over the last 10 years and applying it to a problem like this, we can deliver a breakthrough. I think the opportunity that exists is that if indeed this methodology leads to the discovery of subgroups, not only can it be applied to ALS, but the same methodology could be, be applied to other disease states. So I, I think, you know, my ask of you would be kind of twofold. Be an ambassador for the approach we're taking. Um, you know, we've, we've already got 50 research projects underway, but, you know, there are, there are other data nerds and researchers, you know, everywhere that, that can, you know, dig into the data and start to unravel the mystery. And sometimes I wonder if, you know, if it's going to be unraveled by someone who's not close to the disease. And they're just going to look at it from a different perspective. And so we want to broaden the audience of people that are, that are looking at the data. And the second one is, as I said, we've got a remaining gap relative to funding. And, and to the degree that you do local fundraisers or, or things where you can have an impact, you know, as I always tell the team when we're talking about fundraising, if you don't ask, the answer is always no. And, and so if there's a place uh, where this works for you, it's a support that we always appreciate. So those would be the two things that I ask you. And, and, and as Brittany Brown said, maybe stories are just data with a soul. And uh, we, we got the data and, um, and, and we really do think that we can unravel you know, the mystery that has been and, and continues to be ALS. So that's an overview of the program. Um, the one last thing that Indu wanted me to touch base on was basically my protocol. I'll be honest with you, at times, you know, when I get involved with this project and in discussions with the people at Packard or the other institutes or you know, the neurologists that are involved, I, I sometimes forget that, that I'm also I think patient number seven in the study, and it's, it's my motor neurons that are being created. And so I also spend a fair amount of time just trying to make sure that, that I take care of myself. And uh, as I said earlier, I get my traditional care at Johns Hopkins for a number of reasons. One, it, it's got a great clinic, you know, a, a lady named Laura Clausen who, who just, you know, couldn't be better. Uh, you know, I'm doing in support of her and a guy named John Costello message banking to capture my voice for the future. But the, the key driver is it aligns with the work that I do with ANSWER. When I go to Hopkins for my, re, you know, my checkups and clinical reviews, I tie it into the meetings with Jeff and Emily Baxi on his staff and, and visit the Packard Center and more. And so you know, that's kind of the approach I take from a traditional care. On the non-traditional side, though, I also engage in functional medicine, um, all, you know, natural-based. Uh, I have a heavy focus on toxicity and, and wanting to keep my toxicity levels down. I, I do things like acupuncture that, that, at least in my case, my body has positively responded to. Um, in the area of diet and exercise, I, I, I follow religiously the Walls Protocol. Um, I'm gluten-free, dairy-free, processed sugar-free, alcohol-free. I mean, I'm just disciplined in terms of, of what I put into my body. I, I, I do something called foundation training that's focused on the major muscle groups, um, 
and then I spend a bunch of time in the pool because there I don't have the risk of falling as I get my exercise, but, but I stay very focused there. And then the fourth pillar is, you know, kind of faith, family, and affirmations. And I got the gift of a strong faith, a support of a loving family, and and daily affirmations. And if you if you go, it's going to be five years in November, and I'm still on my feet. And people say why, and I, I think it's a combination of a number of things. And number one is I went through a fairly aggressive de-stress and detox step right up front. I mean, I was traveling around the world every 30 days. I had a busy job and, and I just made the decision that with a disease like ALS, I needed to retire. And that common, in combination with detox and then moving to a very disciplined diet, even though I was already fairly disciplined before, I think made a difference. Number two is I follow a disciplined protocol and I just don't vary. And, and number three, you know, there was, you know, I, as I've interacted with people with this disease, it gets back to this issue of subgroups. Um, I just know that I have a slower form, you know, of the disease in terms of progression. And, and I've got some great friends and colleagues. And, and as I look at their progression, as I look at mine, as I look at theirs through weakness and mine through spasticity, I know it's not the same disease or the same mechanism that starts it which gets back to, you know, why we're doing what we're doing. And, and I'm going to try to use the gift of that time that I've been given to, to try to make a difference. And, and a big part of that is, is answer ALS. And so in my daily affirmations, I affirm that there's no disease that's evolved that our creator will not help in finding a cure. And I increase awareness and attract investment supporting those in search of cure and those bringing better assistive technologies that those that suffer from the disease. I provide discipline and structure leadership to answer ALS. And uh, I affirm to it every day. And uh, if I can do those things, you know, I, I explain to people on a regular basis, none of us are going to get out of this thing alive. And, uh, if in my lifetime I could make a difference in leading CAT, and if I can make a difference in the world of ALS, uh, regardless of what happens, uh, I'm going to consider it a good life. So, Indu, that's uh, the material I had prepared. I'm willing to open it up, and like I said, if you got Jeff on the line, he'd be another great one to, to join in, and uh, I'll stop sharing the screen and let you uh, take control. Thank you, Ed. That was uh, uh, really informative and uh, thank you for sharing your journey as well because there's a lot of questions around, you know, what you're doing uh, as well personally. So um, we have some questions and I think uh, Jeff has been active on the chat answering some of the questions. I know, um, you know, some of these uh, proteomics and the details of how genomics work or the gene is probably very advanced for a lot of, you know, us and also ALS patients were not in the, um, you know, researcher. So might be some questions are probably about definition. So we'll just open up uh, some questions. And uh, we have uh, Zoe here. Uh, Zoe's father was uh, um, uh, affected by ALS uh, in 2017. She's a very active um, individual in our uh, community here. She is actually a rising freshman going to UT Austin next year. She's 19 years old. And also Tara uh, Tarimala, who's uh, my niece, and she has, you know, uh, affected by her uncle, and she just uh, finished her pre-med, and uh, now going on to the medical school she's applying. So we'll have both of them ask you questions and monitor the chat. So I'll let Zoe and Tara take over. Hi, Ed. Um, I'm Zoe. Thank yes, you sir. so much for that incredible presentation. And I just like to say, on behalf of the entire ALS community. Thank you to your team, uh, you and your team at Answer ALS for all of your hard work. And um, you know better than anyone how hard it is to be a patient with ALS. And um, I just, I'm just so glad we have you on our team because you, from what I can tell, you seem very knowledgeable and 
amazing as Indu has described to you. So um, I'm just gonna jump right into the questions. Um, our first question is just to explain the difference between the different types of, types of omics that you had um, mentioned in your presentation, um, like the genomics, proteomics, transgenomics. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, what I would say is, it, and, and uh, Jeff, you can come off mute now because you can probably do a better job of describing it, but if you think about a cell, and the way uh, I had um, somebody describe it, if you go into a cell, and you think about it leaving breadcrumbs and you follow the breadcrumbs and it may lead you to discover why somebody has one signature in terms of a cell versus another. So if you look across the different types, um, let's just take epigenomics, which looks at DNA and the impact of the environment. If you isolate that omic and you compare the ALS patients to the control groups that don't have ALS, what you're looking for is some type of signature that, that says there's a difference between the two. And, and the same in terms of transcriptomics, which is RNA, or proteomics, which is looking at protein. It's not so much to understand what's the detail behind the two, but it's to understand that we're trying to compare those characteristics in the ALS patients versus the controls. And then from that, be able to unravel the, you know, what are the differences that may then lead to the discovery of a subgroup of something that you know, causes it. Jeff, I don't know if you want to add a more scientifically based uh, response to that, but that'd be my view of it. Um, as usual, Ed, you do such a fantastic job. We're going to give you an honorary PhD. Um, no, and, and, and to, to get very sciencey, your body starts with your DNA. It's the building blocks of your body. And so we analyze all of your DNA. So that's one omics. DNA is turned into the next sequence of molecules in your body called RNA. It's a, sort of a match to DNA. And that's another omics. And it's often referred to as transcriptomics. RNA then makes all the proteins in your body. That's called proteomics. What we're essentially doing is we're sequentially looking at all of the building blocks that make up the cells in your body. And Ed mentioned something called epigenomics. That's actually how our DNA is altered by our environment over time. Um, as an example, uh, though not in humans, I, Ed knows I raise honeybees on the side. And what you feed a bee changes whether it becomes a queen or um, a worker bee. And just like our diet affects us as well. Um, and, and that's called epigenomics. It's not just diet, but it's other things. All of those elements together essentially make up who we are and what we're susceptible to having diseases. Historically in medicine, we look for new genes. That's the first starting point. And there are genes that are known to cause ALS, SUD1, C9, or F72, and many others, more than 20 different genes. That's the starting point. <clears throat> but and traditionally, we look for those genes, but it's not the only element today that we know can go wrong. And so today, by looking at all of those elements, I'll go back a step, a thousand patients, we actually would not be able to find new genes. Nowadays, you need thousands of patients to find new genes. But what we're looking for is that most sporadic patients probably don't have new single gene mutations. They have slight tweaks. It's like uh, people know, my patients know I use car analogies, it's like buying a car and have a little dent. And that dent or scratch out of the parking lot 12 years later would be a big rusted hole. That's a minor defect. And all of us have minor defects in our genome. And answer sort of brings all of that together. And now to bring it together, Ed mentioned before, you need sort of big computing. And in fact, Indu um, is helping us with that. We need big computers analyzing how a patient changes over time, um, how the environment affects the body, and all of these omics, even the data we collect from that app, essentially it's 6 billion data points per patient. Our, my desktop computer, what I'm sitting at now, yeah, I can't do that. My regular computer can't do that. So we need the help of many people coming together, bring all of that data. All of that data together, in principle, should help us find subgroups. And one of the people on the, uh, uh, asked, have we actually done anything with this yet? Essentially, you know, what have we done? So we've collected a lot, have we done anything? But one, it takes a while to do things to be fair and honest, but in fact, we already have uh, discovered uh, a new therapy for one form of ALS. 
Now, and that's pretty quick. I'm, I would no way promise that we can develop curative therapies that quickly. And I'm not going to tell you the therapy we discovered. And by the way, everything is a royal we. It's a big group. We'd find, we'd find an answer that quickly. And that's actually why the essence of this program, it's really important, this program, is that it's not just that we're doing it, the, the, the map of the United States that Ed may have showed you, the different sites. In fact, it's sharing this data in an open source, meaning that anyone, any researcher, any academic, or any company has access to this data. And that's really important because it truly will take a team to figure this out. I'm sorry, it was a bit of a long answer. No, no, but, but Jeff, you know, Zoe, the, the point is, if you think about, um, if you look at a lot of the discovery that's ha happened in the world of medicine today, a lot of it's come from small biopharma startups, you know, people that are just got into business and come at it from a new way. And, and there's no way they would have the funding available to them up front to amass this kind of database to to create, you know, we're, we're providing to them IPS cells where they can do their own analysis. We're providing to them bi blood samples, bio samples, if they need those. We're providing to them, you know, all the data in terms of, you know, the people, they can come in and they can select, I want people with this age profile, this ALS, FRS progression curve, uh, limb onset, and we'll give them a subset of data based on that. And you just, you just couldn't do that if you were a small you know, startup pharma. And that's one of the services we want to bring to the complete research uh, system. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Rothstein and Ed. It's great to hear from you guys. We have another question. Um, it says, can you share where stem cell research is going, especially for patients that need it now? And for the new, 50 projects, how is that working to stop the progression or growth of this disease? Yeah, Jeff, on stem cells, uh, I know you have a very strong, I, my view on the stem cells is that at some point in time in history, in the future, it will play a role. But at this point in time, my sense and feel based on what I've been exposed to, it's, it's not ready for prime time. Um, yeah. Yeah, Ed, Ed knows that I'm, and my own patients who are on tonight know that I'm, I'm fairly blunt about science. I try to be very critical about science because there's no point you getting involved with things that are not going to help you. And right now, um, there is, as Ed mentioned, great hope that it could be valuable, right? But right now, there's a lot more hype um, than real value. The stem cells, that's important to understand. When we talk about stem cells, these are not therapeutic stem cells. These are the cells made from, that we make from our patients' bodies that turn into their body cells, but they're not a therapy. It's the equivalent, and Ed mentioned at the very beginning, this is the equivalent of a biopsy. And biopsies have made an enormous difference in cancer by biopsy breast, prostate, skin. We know exactly what's wrong with that patient, and we fine tune the drugs for those patients. We're not curing all cancers, but we're making a lot more headway than when I started in medicine. And this is that equivalent. We're really sampling the nervous system. I cannot biopsy my patients or any of you, your spinal cord. Your spinal cord is the width of my index finger. I take a chunk out, you're paralyzed for life. There's no re repair ever. The nervous system is not like a salamander that can grow a new limb. It's permanent injury. So we just don't do that other than rare cancers. Um, and stem cells, these are not a therapy. So one day, and I'll just end by saying one day we hope stem cells might be a therapy, but I got to tell you, we're making incredible headroads with drugs that target subtypes of patients, patients with SOD1 mutations, patients with C9. And the answer is to apply that same kind of research to all of the other patients who have sporadic ALS. And I think that's a key point. You know, research is demonstrated when they know the target, you know, they make progress. And as Jeff said, I mean, we'll, we'll have meaningful drugs on the market for SOD1 and C9 in what, Jeff, the next two years? Yeah, um, I'm, I think so. Uh, yeah. Those trials are all in phase one right now. They will move ahead. Now, the key there, though, is they knew the target they were going after. They knew the pathway they were trying to affect. The challenge you have is if you look at the world of ALS, that's only about 10% of the population. The other 90% falls into the sporadic case. But I don't want to give anybody on the call tonight any false hope that our research projects that are coming out of this are going to lead to drug discovery in the next two to three years. It doesn't work that way. I think, the, as I said, it's a domino. 
first was, you know, the ability to, through supercomputing and exponential development that, that allowed the capabilities that we have today. The second one is to do a mass collection of the data, turn artificial intelligence, machine learning loose to discover those subgroups. Once you do that, then you go into the research centers. Once they have subgroups, they can start to look for how they affect those pathways and affect the disease. From that, it gets turned over to pharma and eventually the development of a drug and a cure and all the things we want. But as I look at it as a patient, you know, I, I don't have any illusion that what I'm doing here is gonna affect me. But I have a very strong belief that what I'm doing here is gonna affect my kids and the next generation. And so I don't wanna give anybody false hopes, but we've tried the other way of developing drugs, taking them into clinics, and, and hoping they were gonna work without clear understanding of the pathway that may have caused the disease in the individuals. And as I said earlier, we're two for 200, and the two that got approved extend life somewhere in the neighborhood of three to five months. And so my view is, you know, we all know the definition of insanity. You know, doing the same things the same way and expecting different results, and we're trying to do it a different way. Yeah. And, and, and I just wanted to add, you know, um, one thing I know is as we're approaching large companies and, you know, large researchers, when we go and tell them that we have this kind of data, it's, it's been, you know, I talk to Ed and I go, oh, you know, this company wants to talk to us or this, he said, like, how are you attracting them? I said, it's very easy, you know, because of the work that's already been done at Answer. I mean, because this is um, really, really good. It's a gold mine. I mean, you know, and for attracting these brilliant minds to come in and work on it, um, it's, that's what we needed to do. And, and that's what this team, you know, at Answer ALS, which I'm very proud, um, and, you know, to be part of the board of the Answer ALS and help this initiative. Um, it, it's really, you know, I think we need that mind together to go in and look at this data. I think, I think the answer is in there, uh, as Ed said, but it is, um, but Andy, going you, into the data. you raise a great point. I mean, you know, I was a business guy. Businesses, you know, yeah, they do good things, but they're, they're always, they always have a motive in terms of what they want. I mean, IBM is, is a great partner, but if, if you want to engage Watson, what do you got to have? Is you got to have a massive database and complex problems you're trying to solve. We have that. Uh, Microsoft is an outstanding partner, and I think they see opportunities to develop AI as they analyze the data. Jeff and I had a call with a new artificial intelligence company that's going to do some you know, amazing things with the data. And Jeff, at the end of the call, says, "Okay, you know, this is all fine, but we don't have any money to give you." And their response is, "We're going to do it for free." Because if we can demonstrate our capability on your data, then we'll monetize it when we go to other places. And so the value of the data is what we really bring. And, um, and I think we're starting to see, as Andrew you know, mentioned, companies that are interested um, you know, based on the value of that data. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Ed and Dr. Rothstein for that response. Um, moving on to the next question. Um, this question is from Linda Tolisano, and she would like to know what exactly you've learned from the data you've collected so far. Well, you know, like I said, we got 50 research projects. Jeff talked earlier about uh, the, the first indication that's going to lead to you know, drug trial. There's been some indications of subgroups that have started to show themselves, but it's early days. And so, you know, those are things, Jeff, that come to mind that we've started. Uh, the other thing that I think we've, we've uh, discovered is how you set up and structure a project like this. Um, you know, we had a great meeting uh, with the Gates Foundation and they wanted to understand our process. Um, you know, some of the other disease states, Jeff's done some work on taking the same process in a smaller scale into Alzheimer's. 
I think we've also learned a lot about how you organize a large project like this with multi-clinics, multi-research centers, and what it takes to do it. Um, so I think as we see other disease states follow suit, I think there's gonna be a lot of lessons learned we can pass on to them as well. Yeah, I don't know what you wanna to add to that on what we've learned today. Um, let's, like all things with expectations, you are appropriately a community that needs answers fast. And, and look, I've been seeing ALS patients since 1989, so I know this very well. And I know the frustration you have felt and we have felt. This project is really only getting to the stage where we're starting to give data out. Yeah, we're doing our own stuff among that team that Ed showed you, but we're giving this data out. The timeline from giving that data out to, I'm gonna make this up now, to a Lilly or to a Biogen or to MIT, then they have to work with it and eventually share their results. So that's a timeline, quite frankly, quite honestly, none of us can predict. We, knew, we do know we've given it out to dozens and dozens of groups, both companies and, and researchers around the world. Now it's a bit of a waiting game from what they do while we do our own work. It's kind of like, uh, it's probably a crappy analysis. Um, you know, we just landed on the moon. We just came back with those moon rocks. We know we have them. And what do we learn from them? Um, I don't know if we learned a lot, but someone did. Um, so the idea is that we've just got our early sets of information. It's already proving that it's fruitful and there are people interested in it. And I'm having done this for a long time, I'm really convinced that this data, whether our team does it or someone else does it, this will be really valuable data to a research community to find the answers for ALS. I like your cat, didn't do. <laughs> I didn't realize that you gave up for that. <laughs> you really get to know people. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. Um, Ed, you mentioned you were diagnosed in 2015. So we have a question that says, how has your progression been since then? Uh, the progression has been uh, kind of a slow, gradual decline in mobility. Uh, like I said, I, I first noticed the onset by jogging you know, with my son and catching my toe about every 15 steps. And then six to nine months later, you know, I had trouble jogging and then you know, six to 12 months later, walking was a bit more difficult. Today, I walk with two arm crutches. And so mobility uh, has really been impacted. Uh, but I'm, I'm still on my feet. Breathing capacity is held. Strength's good. I mean, my neurologist is on the phone, so he can give you his views on how I'm doing. But, you know, you know with the way it's presented back to this issue of different forms of the disease, Everything in terms of my presentation to date has indicated that it started in the upper motor neuron, uh, which tends to, you know, demonstrate itself through spasticity and stiffness. Whereas other people, it may initiate in the lower motor neuron where you can get initial weakness. And I think it just gets back to this issue that there's, there's just not one form of the disease, but there's not a day. I mean, I understand that the tragedy of this disease. I mean, I got a, a wife, you know, three kids, three grandsons, one more on the way, and the uncertainty that comes from it. And, you know, when I was diagnosed, given two to five years to live, I mean, I've, I've been to, to the movie. And, and like I said, all I said earlier, somehow, some way, I've been given the gift of time, and uh, I just want to use it wisely. And for me, a big part of that is answer. Thank you so much Ed, um, for that response and for sharing your journey with us. Um, the next question is from Lisa and she would like to know if you ever did a metal detox, um, perhaps from toxins or different types of metals. Yes, I've done. And, uh, I went through what I would uh, call a heavy detox in the early days. Uh, I, you know, following a German protocol. I, I, I'm in the middle of a natural uh, one now that I do, and toxicity is something I, I watch and monitor closely. And I said in the early days, I think de-stress and detox were the two things that I did that that had the greatest impact. Um, now, Jeff will probably tell you, and I'm just lucky I got slow progression, but the one thing that I always, when I think about my protocol, the one thing I never lose sight of is that not only am I fighting the disease, but my family is watching the journey. And 
if this thing goes south, you know, the one thing I want them to be able to say is Ed was all in. You know, he, he never gave up. He never deviated. He, you know, he, he fought from start to finish. And, and that's why I follow the protocol that I do. And, and that's why I try to make a difference in the role I play with answer. Thank you, Ed. Uh, our next question is from Jennifer and she asks, um, what are your thoughts about Rowdy Kava? Well, okay. Um, I tried Radicava for a six month period of time. And um, for me, you know, it just didn't work. First of all, I, I, I think I've become fairly good at what I would call many experiments, you know, taking my protocol, making adjustments to the protocol, and then determining if there's any change. And what I'd say is I froze everything else I was doing. I went on Radicava for a six month period of time and I didn't sense any change in the trajectory in terms of my gait, which is primarily where I'm seeing it. And, and so the decision in consultation with Jeff that I made was that it was also sacrificing my lifestyle. Uh, it's very invasive. Um, you know, the port, uh, you know, 10 days on, 14 days on, off. While you have the port, I was limited in terms of exercise and time in the pool. And, and so the combination of not feeling that it was making a difference and the negative impact that it had in terms of lifestyle, I made the call, you know, not to continue it. In fact, every time there's a new drug trial, I turn to Jeff and say, is there any way you know if this drug goes after the pathway that causes my disease? And his response is no. And, and that's, that's the dilemma that we all have until we understand the subgroups and the pathways. You know, any drug trial, in my mind, is, is going to be a bit of a shot in the dark, except those that are focused on the genetic form of the disease. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Deborah, and she would like to know if you looked into the gut microbiome as a part of your genome analysis. Jeff, do you want to cover? Yeah, yeah. Microbiome? So it was originally planned, and there's a subgroup of about a hundred of our patients that were part of a microbiome project, kind of separate, um, and. Uh, uh, Microbiome is a is a right now a difficult topic. I don't mean it's difficult scientifically. It's it's fraught with a lot of ups and downs, and our patients collected the right way. Um, so we have that data, and eventually, when the time comes, we'll be able to integrate that data in the other data sets. It's not actually not being integrated right now, but we have it. It's actually part of the of our team through um, a group out of Harvard um, that's collected uh, that data. But we uh, but we haven't expanded on it. We actually think. The metabolism of the cells is a little more relevant uh, than meaning your brain cells than uh, the metabolism that occurs in your get, uh, gut, uh, the microbiome. But we're aware that there's um, some interest. What's been published so far in ALS, to be fair, is um, mixed. I'll just leave that as a, as a code word for problematic. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, our next question is from Shelly. And she asks, are you taking any supplements right now? Yeah, I've got uh, a group of supplements that I take. It's, um, you know, like I said, I, I probably won't go into it in terms of detail here, but if you got an individual request, I'd, I'd share my protocol and supplements I take on a regular basis. Um, so, yeah, I mean, as I said, I follow a non-traditional, you know, functional medicine approach to it. Um, so yeah, I, I, I take supplements, uh, you know, and, and really, I mean, in, in some ways, um, you, you're trying to almost get yourself back to, I mean, the body wasn't, you know, I talked about foundation training. The body wasn't designed to set 10 hours a day or 15 hour flights. I mean, and so the exercise routine I go through is really focused on waking up the major muscle groups every day. Um, in some respects, our bodies weren't meant to consume a lot of the things that we consume today. I mean, if you think of, you know, my diet's very much based on kind of the early, you know, grass-fed, you know, beef, range-free chicken, 
you had fresh caught fish, uh, you know, the red berries, the leafy, green, leafy greens, those types of things. And, and so what I'm trying to do is to almost get back to what the body was designed to consume focus on toxicity in terms of keeping it clean and in supplementing it where I need to based on deficiencies. Um, but yeah, I, you know, it's just a method that I've, I don't try any crazy. If I'm going to, Jeff always says, if you're going to try anything, you know, I, and I always say it's very something every ALS patient should be careful. There's a lot of people out there selling snake oil. And, and I think you got to be really careful of, of that. And, and I've been. But I also believe in, in, like I said, trying to get your body almost back to the way it was originally designed. And I'm amazed in the world that we live in today, the amount of toxicity that we allow into our systems each and every day. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Shalina Lalji. Um, and she would like to know if you could expand on the best technology or testing available that could possibly identify the trigger or the epigenetic components that caused an, indi an individual's ALS? Um, because we, as you mentioned before, every ALS patient is, the case is so specific. I mean, I think what we're trying to do with the answer is apply that best in class capability to, to answer that question. And I, I think that's, you know, the question is, that, that's exactly what answer ALS was designed to do, using the best capability. You know, one of the things we didn't talk about up front, but the amount of time we've spent on quality control. You're going to build a database like this and you're going to draw, you know, conclusions out of it in terms of subgroups. You know, you got to have an incredible focus on quality. Um, we, we relied on the best institutions to do things like whole genome sequencing and going through the New York Genome Center. You know, Jeff, you can take him through the, all the work we did on the creation of motor neurons and trying different protocols based on the you know, number of days to make sure we got that part of it right before we went into the omics. Um, and I, I think we're trying to bring the best capability and tools to play, and, and that's really what we've designed the program around. Awesome. Thank you. Our next question is from Tom Radcliffe, and he says, are you familiar with NIR, near-infrared therapy? What is the efficacy of this protocol? Yeah, I'm, a, I'm aware of it. I've, uh, you know, once again, had some people that have suggested it. I, I've opted instead. Infrared sauna is part of my protocol, um, but, but I know some people have tried it. Uh, you know, it's just not been something that I've added to my regimen or, or tried. Um, you know, Jeff, I don't know if you got any opinion on it. Uh, I, I don't. Um, there are a lot of things out there and I just, uh, I don't know them all, but um, I'm, and Ed knows I'm generally, I have no qualms about people trying things uh, in reasonable moderation. So uh, for example, people love to take supplements, that's fine, but there are concerns. So for example, vitamin B in excess, it kills your nerves. So you need to know the sort of the boundaries of what you do. When someone comes to you and says, or you read something and says, you know, try this, it's, it's great. It'll cost you $25,000, but I guarantee you, you run as fast as you can from that. Because that's usually what Ed uh, referred to as snake oil. Um, so, uh, but trying things, I, I think it's absolutely. Uh, someone wrote, and I really like this. I hadn't heard that. One of you, and I, I should find this, says ALS takes everything from you, or I'm not getting exactly right, um, but hope. And I think that's important. I think it's a great sentiment, a way of thinking. It does take things away that we as neurologists just cannot replace yet. We're working hard at that. But that spirit of, of working and, and thinking positive is so important. I, and I was listening while I was doing some other things before this started and hearing some of you. And boy, uh, hope and positive spirit count, carry so much weight. And I've seen this, I've seen over 10,000 patients in my career so far. And I got to tell you, that spirit carries an enormous weight in how people handle this really terrible disease. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, Jeff, it's interesting, though. I was, um, one of the things that I could do after diagnosis was ride a bike, um, you know, and, but as time went on, it got a little more difficult, you know, not when I was up on the bike, but when I had to stop and start, especially if I had to do it quickly. And I finally decided you know, Jeff always tells me trauma is not good for the disease, so don't hurt yourself. And so I said, you know, no more. 
And then a dealer out of Europe, um, you know, came along and he, I've got a three wheel bike now and it's, uh, it's got great balance. I can stop, sit still. I can not only ride it when my son jogs, I can ride it when our daughter walks her 18 month old grandson. But not long ago, I was on a bike ride in the morning while my son runs. We used to run together and, and now we can't do it. And so this is the next best thing. And his comment was, you know, I'm, and he, and he said, don't take it wrong, but he said, I'm, I'm glad it's, it's ALS and instead of Alzheimer's. He said, you know, as long as I know that I'm always gonna have access to your mind, I'm gonna be okay. And it does take a lot of things away. Um, but I think the fact that we as patients can always connect to the people that we love and know them and they know us, you know, is, is one thing that it, it doesn't take away. Okay, well, thank you. That was a great answer. Um, the next question is from Kathy, and she's wondering whether your data as a slower progressor would exhibit differently from someone who's a fast progressor, and if there are any other samples of people who are um, a particularly slow progressor. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, Jeff, you can talk about some of the data that we reviewed and some of the work that MIT has done and, and you know, in the different progression patterns and how actually from the data we're drawing better conclusions than ALS, FRS on progression and others. But the, the, the data gives any researcher the capability to go in and probe based on different factors. And so, yeah, there are other people that fit my profile in the data. And so, you know, you can go in and query, I want somebody, you know, this age profile, this type of progression of ALS, FRS, you know, this type of breathing capacity, and, and it will, and that's one of the things that I think we're eventually going to get to, you know, at some point is individualized medicine and the ability to take each of our data, break it down and, and get to individualized care. I mean, the, we talk about the, the testing in the dish. Uh, if we can create individual motor neurons from ALS patients, you know, Jeff, I don't know if it's outlandish to think that at some point in time when you have drug trials, you could have a pre-screening that runs those drugs into the dishes and understands how each of the individual patients' motor neurons respond to the drugs. And it could inform you on which patients to put into what drug trials. And, and I think those kinds of steps are gonna come in time. Yeah, Ed, uh, exactly. When we originally designed the Answer ALS program, that was our first thought, was that we would test drugs uh, in the cells and then just target patients. The pro and, and it sounds great. In fact, there are already some companies doing that. Turns out it's actually short-sighted because well, one, which of the drugs you're testing? Are they the right ones? Have you matched the right drug to the right patient? So it's more intelligent to know what's wrong in that patient and then find the right drug. At least we believe it's more intelligent to do it that way. Um, but time will tell whether that, that's an appropriate uh, way to do things. But the slow versus fast, several of you have asked that question. It's a really important question to all of us. I mean, really important because I have patients, I still follow some patients who've had the disease for 30 years. And quite honestly, I've had patients who've um, moved on within three months really very fast, very slow. What's the difference? What underlies that? What's the biology of someone's nervous system? If I can understand why someone's disease moves so slow, the biological pathways, can I apply that understanding to patients who have a faster form of the disease? And this is where answer ALS wields potentially great power. We have patients who are very slow and very fast. We have the bio, and we will have that biology whether I can figure it out. And again, it's the royal we, it's not me, it's a, a team or companies, that's incredibly powerful data. But I'll tell you why, and I'm gonna get a little sciency here for a second, why it's so important to really know the biology and not just the clinical phenotype. Ed's right, we can define five or six different patterns of progression, but they have nothing to do yet with the underlying biology, not yet. And the best example of that, we've actually known for years, SOD1 mutations cause one form of familial ALS. They're more than a hundred different mutations of just that protein. That is, imagine that 
proteins, a string of pearls. You knock out pearl number one, you get ALS. You knock out pearl number 50, you still get ALS. So different pearls of that string. Turns out in the United States, the most common form of that mutation in SOD1, ALS patients, is a very fast disease. It's a very fast disease. Very fast, less than a year, quite frankly. But another form of that same protein when it's mutated, the disease goes on for decades. So same protein mutated, yet very different courses. What else in those patients' body is changing the course of the disease? So the mutation alone isn't telling us enough. It's knowing those other pathways, and that's the kind of data that we think we'll get from answering LS. Thank you so much. Um, our next question is from Shalina Lalji, and she asks, what are you doing with the motor neurons you're growing? Have you seen a lot of P62 genes in your samples? Yeah, I'm going to answer. <laughs> I said, what, it, what we're doing with the motor neurons we're growing is that's the first step. And Jeff talked about the sequence from DNA to RNA and, and down through. So once we complete the motor neurons, then that allows the next step in the process, which is to do the analytics around the different levels of omics, which then allows that data to be loaded out and, and made available. I mean, I, you know, Jeff, you know, we always talk about, you know, answer ALS and I compare it to a factory. I mean, we're trying to build a product and here the product is going to be, and it was one of the things early on that we, we agreed on is a clear definition of winning. For phase one of answer ALS, the definition of winning is to build a repository that's made available to everybody in the world doing research on ALS for free, leading to the discovery of subgroups. If, if we do that in phase one, we will bring value to the ALS community that will pay you know, dividends for years and decades to come. Phase two will then be taking those findings, the discovery of those subgroups, and letting it lead to first research and then the handoff from research into pharma and lead to drugs and drug trials. Um, and, and I think it's important for you to understand, I mean, I would call this the long game. Um, and, and because, you know, tr drugs to trial without understanding pathways, as I said earlier, we've been to the movie. And we're two for 200 with limited efficacy. It just hasn't worked. And, and so yeah, I agree with you. I'm, I'm as impatient, and Jeff will tell you this, as anybody on let's go faster. But, but I'm absolutely convinced until you get to root cause, until you get to pathways, you know, you, you're just not going to make progress in, in this disease. Absolutely. Um, great answer. And that sounds like some really great work upcoming. Um, the next question is from Michelle. And she was wondering if Jeff could talk about any research into ALS clusters specifically around Great Lakes, lakes in Italy, industrial plants in Michigan, or lead smelter plants in Missouri? Yeah, so probably not intelligently, quite frankly. There's a limit to any one of us, our knowledge base, and that's more of an epidemiologist expertise, quite honestly, people who study patterns. All of us know in ALS, have been around doing this for a while, that there have been a lot of epidemiologic studies. So let me define that. Epidemiologic studies are when you take populations, you try to find out what are common elements that be, could be causing a problem a health problem or something else like the original toxicity um, like uh, love canal things like that um, many years ago um, what i've learned from them is one there's always pockets in the disease it's ne it's never perfectly scattered across the country or the world each of those at least some of them have had um, different theoretical causes in all cases i know of no clear strong environmental toxin that definitely causes ALS. I mean, definitely. Just like if you ingest cyanide, you'll die. That's a clear toxin. The environmental studies have only hinted at things and never been super strong about them. One many years ago with football players, um, again, there's a slightly higher incidence of football players. Is that trauma or is it the type of person who goes into it or is there all the existing conditions before someone got involved? You know, the soccer players in Italy, was it the... Um, uh, the uh, insecticide used on lawns or, or, or the, um, the nutrition, I'm blocking in the right words, for lawns. It's just not clear. I don't think anyone's ever been 
um, firm about that. So we pay attention to those. We want, we again, globally want to know about them, but I got to tell you, unlike Parkinson's where there's been a stronger link to pesticides, there's just not been really a convincing link in those diseases. Of course, that's frustrating. And any, any one of us who are neurologists, and any of you, are, of course, as patients are all frustrated by why did I get this disease? If it wasn't in my family. It's different. That's a gene. Why did I get that? And we always look to well, what else could have been. Was it that accident I had when I was 15? I mean, I can tell you, I have had, and every neurologist has their own personal stories of someone who's intimately linked to an event. I'll always remember a patient I had years ago who was a logger. Logs rolled over him in an accident. Within a week, he was twitching. What you know is fasciculations all over his body developed rapidly progressive ALS. Was it that trauma? Or did the accident happen because he slipped and fell because he already had some weakness, didn't realize it, and that was a subsequent event? I have no way of sorting that out. And there have been lots of studies. And I, I honestly, I'm sorry, I'm giving too long an answer. I don't know that answer. Thank you so much for speaking on that. Um, our next question is from Dan. He says, is this data currently available to all researchers? For instance, UPMC in Pittsburgh or Cleveland, Cle Cleveland Clinic researchers, is the system of data being utilized by all those who can? Yeah, it is available to, to all comers. Uh, we've got, um, like I said, 50 research projects already on the way. It's being accessed by people not only in the US, but uh, around the world. And it's really part of, you know, back to what I asked, you know, in terms of what you could do, we're in, a, we're in a process now of trying to raise the awareness of the data being available. Um, you know, in the early days, we, we didn't do that because we were building the factory. But as I said, we've started to release the data. In fact, about 30 days ago, we released the, the richest, if you would, set of data in the world of ALS, I think probably in history yet, where it was the first time that both you know, clinical and genetic and, you know, the uh, IPS cells and the omics was released on an individual end to end. And, and so we've, we've decided up front that we're gonna release this. We have a data release schedule that's, that's already published. And, and as we get the data completed, we're gonna turn it loose. Um, you know, in the early days, there were some people inside the study that says, well, let us look at it first. And, and we were very clear, no, this is a global open access. Anybody can take a look at it. And so they, yeah, that data is out there today and openly available. Great. Um, thank you for that response. Um, the next question is from Kathy, and she was wondering if uh, Ed followed the WALS protocol that was originally designed for uh, MS, or if it's an adapted version for ALS. No, uh, I've spent a lot of time with Dr. WALS, um, and I follow uh, the exact prescription. I mean, she's done some limited testing within MS and showed positive efficacy. Uh, and like I said, you know, there's not been any trials re regarding it uh, in the world of ALS. But I, I would tell you, if um, if somebody tomorrow came and said we got a cure, I wouldn't I wouldn't change a single element of my protocol. Um, you know, I, I feel good. I'm I feel healthy. I I sleep well. My mind's clear. I mean, you know, I. I I, I, I do think there is back to, you know, Jeff, you know, says, well, I'm not sure it has an impact. And I tell him, well, you can change what a bee does by what you feed it. I mean, don't you think it impacts a human as well? And, and I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go back, you know, regardless of what, you know, like I said, if I was cured tomorrow, I'd, I'd still execute the same protocol. Awesome. Thank you, Ed. Our next question is from Michelle. Um, she says, it, it's hard for people who live in rural areas to get the same care and accessibility to treatment. How do these people get good care and do you have any recommendations for people in rural communities? Uh, you know, I think that's a, an absolute uh, reality of the disease. And I think one of the gifts of pandemic is going to be the advent of telemedicine. As I said earlier, in one of the areas that, that I do think that we're going to put a greater focus on it and the Packard centers talking about it is what I would consider to be assistive technologies where you can monitor the disease from a distance when you can really go through a lot of the observation that you do you know at the clinic in an engagement like this 
And, and I think it's, you know, especially as disease progression occurs and the difficulty on not only the patient, but the caregiver. Um, I, I think one of the gifts of the pandemic is we've demonstrated that, that you can do a lot through telemedicine. And I think the application of that in the world of ALS is, is going to come. I mean, if I look at the way we designed the original answer ALS, if we would have thought through all the capability that exists, we could have done a lot of what we did in the clinics virtually. And, and I, I think you're going to continue to see that field of study and application in medicine, you know, expand and grow. I, Jeff, I'm assuming you agree with that. Oh yeah, telemedicine, I mean, COVID's horrible and really horrible from what I've seen at Hopkins. But boy, telemedicine has changed uh, uh, the way we do things. It's uh, all, and it's not just neurologists, it's across the board. Uh, I, so there's two sides of that. One, it's fantastic for following patients. It's horrible for that very first visit though, when you're referred to a place like Hopkins, Harvard, or the major medical centers, not to see a patient examine them. ALS is not a disease. You can, I, I, I'm looking at all of you. I cannot diagnose a disease by looking at your head. I need to examine your reflexes. I need to do certain tests. And that's been a limiting factor. And fortunately, all, most of the clinics in the country are just starting up again. So we're, we're building into a backlog of patients who, have, who are desperate to be seen. But in the future, uh, telemedicine and digital medicine are, are a way to really help not just patients who live in my case, the Baltimore area, but, but the rural patients. There are plans, in fact, just before this call, I was on another call with, with a group. Um, are there ways in which we can actually build up a, a, a network where sure, you, you live in, I, I'm sorry, if any of you are from Iowa, I always pick Iowa. You live in Iowa, you know, in cornfields, and uh, you now want your neurologist thinks maybe it could be, but you're too far away from a big city to go to a major medical center. Could we have a panel of experts that, with telemedicine review your data? Maybe we're not your primary physicians, but can really add a layer of, of um, evaluation and maybe additional recommended tests. So I, I actually think this is going to be a future approach that we'll be able to employ in medicine that we're just starting to have conversations about. How can we help people that can't come to the major medical centers? And I think that's desperately needed. And the flip side of that, I'll just add, because I don't want to talk too long, is that, well, can we conduct clinical trials also from afar? Traditionally, you got to come to Baltimore. you got to come to Boston to do a clinical trial. But you live in Iowa. You just can't fly there that easily. It's expensive. Well, with digital medicine, there are ways we can monitor you. The app that, um, um, that Ed mentioned to you, we can monitor your breathing from that. We can monitor your speech. We can monitor how well you think. So we can monitor a lot of things and maybe it's not so necessary for everyone to come so far for some clinical trials. And so these are thoughts that we're uh, beginning to really dig into uh, over the, um, in the upcoming year. Thanks so much, Jeff. Um, actually jumping off of what you just said about telemedicine, um, Indu was wondering how COVID-19 has affected the clinical trials you're working on. Oh, sorry, I, I was muted. Um, so COVID has been, okay, two sides of it. COVID's horrible for people that get COVID, truly get are hospitalized with it. I mean, really a horrible disease. Don't underestimate it at all. It's also been horrible for every other medical disease because all clinical trials nationwide, I mean every clinical trial, ALS, Alzheimer's, epilepsy, Parkinson's, cancers, they've all gone on hold because people, we, we're not bringing people to our medical centers to give out drugs for the risk of them getting exposed. And so all ALS trials have been on hold and we're only now getting ready to restart them. And it varies. The Southern states who have opened up a little bit more, meaning their medical centers have for whatever reason, um, are, are probably gonna start trials. And by the way, every trial is a little different. It depends on what you wanna measure. So for example, many of you know that we have to do a breathing test as part of your evaluation. Okay, breathing test spews out all of that particulates that have potential COVID. So we can't do them so, we couldn't do them readily in clinics because everyone gets exposed. They were completely outlawed at major at medical centers. But we're just beginning to work around that. And um, so we think in the next month, trials will start, uh, will start up again. I can't tell you which trial, which medical center, but we're at least heading back to that. And that's really hopeful because to end this point, 
there are more clinical trials coming up in ALS in the next year than in not my entire career. I've never seen this many trials starting up. It's an incredibly hopeful time. Now, I'm not going to tell you they're all great. Some of them are fantastic and some of them are complete junk. Um, and then knows I speak to that. <laughs> and I won't run the drug trials in Baltimore. But on the other hand, it just says that there are a lot of companies interested in moving with us and using our data and beginning to move into clinical trials. And that's incredibly hopeful for patients. Thank you so much. Um, for our next question, we wanted to re-ask from Shalina Lalji. Um, have you seen a lot of P62 gene in your samples? Uh, not, I'm not aware of the, the term. And, and Jeff, I think you just said, if, in terms of gene discovery, it's going to take a larger data set than what we've got. Yeah, I know P62, and I can't say that we've specifically focused on a particular gene yet in terms of the kinds of pathways that we're looking at. Um, so I honestly don't know that answer yet. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question, and I think this is our this is our final question. Um, the next question is from Michelle for Ed, and she was wondering if you had sporadic or familiar familial ALS, and if it is sporadic, do you know what could be your possible ex environmental exposures that might have caused your ALS? Um, mine is sporadic. Um, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm from a, my, a, a huge family. I've got mom and dad, seven kids. So they got 23 grandkids. They're now at uh, 42 great grandkids. Um, I mean, it's, uh, it's an army. When we get together, we got to rent the gym. Uh, and I'm the only incident of ALS. Uh, so it's, it is sporadic. And I have no clue what, what triggered it. Um, I remember the diagnosis, you know, I knew something was wrong. I, I just didn't have any clue. It could be, you know, for me, life-threatening and career-ending and everything else that happened on that November day back in 2015. And sometimes I get asked, you know, what's the, you know, one question you want an answer to? And that's kind of it. You know, what, what triggered it? What, what caused it? Because I remember telling the doctor, this is not possible. I mean, um, I always exercised, always had a good diet. I, you know, maintain, I weighed the same as I did when I graduated from you know, college. I mean, I just took care of myself. And his response was, that's a pretty normal profile for somebody with ALS. And so I, I got no clue as to what the trigger. But in the, tonight's a good example. I, it didn't take me long to figure out that there's, I mentioned Jay Fishman earlier. Jay said, you got a choice. You can, you can stay in bed or you can stay engaged. And it didn't take me long to figure out that, that it, it, there was no value add to trying to figure out the mystery behind me. And there was value add to, as I said, looking for utilization of new technologies and with a high degree of collaboration, there was value in engaging in something like that. And, uh, you know, I referenced it earlier. My father-in-law was here. Our daughter got married. I, I was, I've now successfully walked my two daughters down the aisle. I told them, don't wait too long, but, but I got that job done. And, and when my father-in-law, who lived back in Peoria, where Caterpillar is headquartered, and he told me the story about guys at his church and he said they were talking about me leaving cat and how it was a sad story. And, and I told him, I just don't see it that way. Um, and I had a great 37 year career. I love the company, the people, and I really felt I made a difference, but you know, today and tonight, you know, I get a chance to one engage with a, a bunch of people that are truly a gift and secondly work on something that in the long term i really do think will make a difference and you know if if i get to check both those boxes you know regardless of where this thing goes i'm, I'm gonna be just fine
Wonderful. Well, on that note, um, by the way, my name is Sarah. I'm one of the AL, um, Everything ALS teammates. And I wanted to thank Ed and Jeff as well for coming and speaking with us tonight. Um, Jeff has been gracious to offer July 15th as the day that he will come and speak to everyone directly. So um, mark your calendars for that wonderful meeting then. Uh, we are going to move to our open forum model where everyone is able to unmute themselves and discuss um, anything that comes to mind. But First and foremost, again, thank you so much, Ed, for your wonderful presentation and all your willingness to share your story as well as everything that Answer ALS is doing. And Jeff, for your expertise um, from Johns Hopkins, we, we really appreciate um, your background and, and your education tonight. So on that note, if we could um, transition and uh, we'll get to see how everybody's doing. Thank you.